Uh, good evening and welcome to the City of Cambridge General Committee meeting of Tuesday, June 27th, 2017. We have a, a really wonderful crowd out here tonight uh, for the Cambridge Hall of Fame induction, so it's wonderful to see so many people in the audience tonight. Um, the, the, uh, just to let you know the reason I'm in the chair, uh, I'm an inexperienced chair, usually Councillor Armetta does this, it's the first time I've done General Committee, so hopefully uh, I won't mess things up too much and uh, I'll keep things in order. Uh, Councillor Mehta is attending the St. Benedict's graduation on, the, on behalf of the city, so that's why I'm in the, in the chair this evening. Uh, the first thing we're going to move on to is disclosure of interest. Uh, does any member uh, in the committee uh, have a pecuniary interest to declare? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on. Uh, the first order of business tonight is um, a presentation for the induction in the Cambridge uh, Hall of Fame. And this is being done by Councillor uh, Donna Reed, who is the council liaison to the Cambridge Hall of Fame Committee. And uh, Councillor Reed uh, has the honour of introducing our newest members to the Cambridge Hall of Fame. Yes, I'm going to come down here so I'm closer to you and also uh, so that uh, you can be a part of it rather than being up there. So tonight we are here to honour and induct four new members to the Cambridge Hall of Fame. The criteria for entrance to the hall is significant service to the community by men, women or organisations who have made our city a better place in which to live or have brought renown to the city through their deeds elsewhere. We do have a selection committee that considers all nominees and chooses worthy candidates each year. I am very pleased to present this year's candidates and declare them inducted to the Cambridge Hall of Fame. The first inductee is Robert, or as we know him better, Bob Green. Bob Green is a writer, artist, musician, and humorist, one of Galt's best known and best loved contributors to Canadian art and letters. He was born here in 1930, graduated from Ryerson's journalism program, worked at the Vancouver Sun, but returned to Galt as the wire editor of The Reporter. His books include eavesdropping stories from small towns where sin was fun, recollections and stories of Galt, Preston and Hespler that were taken from his widely enjoyed Cambridge Reporter columns, and it takes all kinds, more stories about the local communities and their characters. The Great Leap Backward, originally published in 1968, came out again in 2015. It is a prophetic work of fiction about people who fear machinery and computers. Green's artistic media are primarily oils and acrylic. According to an article he wrote in the Cambridge Citizen, Bob opened his first art gallery, the first of four, in 1976 about the back end of the, the Bank of Commerce at the corner of Water and Main. He supplemented his artistic income by working as a porter at the Cambridge Memorial Hospital. Some of his work is held in the City of Cambridge Corporate Art Collection, and another piece is held by the City of Cambridge Archives. Many are in private collections. The multi-talented Green starred in a Canadian short film, Metamorphosis, which won the short film Palme d'Or of the Cannes Film Festival in 1976. Green played the part of a man who makes his home in an elevator. It has been music that has been Green's lifelong companion. Interested in music from his early childhood, he became a jazz drummer for local bands in his high school years. Playing for the Charlie Russ Trio and Johnny Costigan's band at Preston's Leisure Lodge. He has played all kinds of bands including country and western and played at Melford Manor on Lake Muskoka with Robert Kerr. More recently, he played with the Artie Trio. 
Green was awarded the Bernice Adams Award in 1982 for visual arts and in 1998 won the Bernice Adams Special Trustee Award. The Rotary Club gave him a Paul Harris Fellowship in 1997. I'm sure there's much more we could say about Bob Green, but that's what I have here. And now I'd like to invite him to come forward, please. Here, Bob. Bob, come back here. Oh, he's gone. It's all right. Right here. I'd like to thank uh, Clyde Warrington because I think the reason I'm here is because of all those silly columns I wrote about gold and about making gold greater. <laughs> and it was Clyde who got me started. We started with one, and then he said, let's try another one. And we wound up with 600, and the paper folded up. <laughs> and my wife, Veronica Ross, who's written far more than I have, but she kept me going, uh, kept me breathing in and out through my various surgeries. Uh, well, there's, that's Clyde taking my picture now. Now the, uh, I see here we have things I've done. Yeah, Bernie's out of the all, boy. I, can, I can't, uh, I can't enumerate all the things I've done. There's so many. I think I should get a knighthood. <laughs> That's next. That's a, next. A, a, next not, a knighthood. A knighthood. So anyway, I worked at the, uh, the hospital in Gaul for 16 years. So they left my medical career out. And quite possibly some of the people who couldn't make it here tonight are people I operated on. Uh, anyway, they mentioned my paintings. I played drums for 70 years. That must be a record of some sort. 
part it's the um, it's the writing that I think is the most important but I better not stand up here any longer and waste your time sounding off about things I've done so we'll make room for the rep representatives of the other people okay Well, he certainly deserves a round of applause. Thank you, Bob, for uh, regaling us with some of your <laughs> exploits. The second uh, person who entered the Hall of Fame is Matthew, or better known as Matt Kirkwood. In 19, pardon me, in 1894, he was hired at 18 to outfit the initial powerhouse of the Galt and Preston Street Railway. 1902, he was promoted to powerhouse superintendent. In 1907, became general superintendent of the railway operations and planning. He rerouted freight traffic off King Street in Preston, changed the entrance to the CPR rail yards in Galt, and linked Galt Industries south of the river to the local railway network. In 1915, he designed and supervised installation of the electrical system for the entire Lake Erie and Northern Railway from Galt to Port Dover. 1915 to 1918, he designed a plan for upgrading the wooden car fleet to steel passenger cars. The 26th of September in 1917, he was promoted to general manager of both the GRR and the LENN. In 1921, the Sutherland Commission described Matt's submission as most valuable. In 1922, he authored an article in Electric Traction of Chicago on Electric Railroad Management System. In 1923, CPR sent Matt to Western Canada to evaluate electrification of its mountain division. In 1931, he devised a plan to joint administration of the GRR and the LENN as the CP Electric Lines. In 1939, he published an historical outline of GP, GP&H, the P&B, and the LENN. He retired in 1946 at 69, after 52 years with the railway. He died in July 1951 from lung and liver cancer at the age of 75 and is buried at the Blair Cemetery. We have with us tonight his granddaughter, Stephanie Kirkwood Walker, who will accept this on his behalf. Our next Hall of Fame is Harold Aaron Steger. Harry, as he was known, was born in Hessler on January 16, 1926, to Charles H.A. Steger and his wife, the former Lily Baker. Harry attended Hessler Public School and Preston High School. Returning home in 1946, after serving as an air gunner in the Royal Canadian Air Force, 
Gary obtained his funeral director's license and joined the Stagger family funeral and furniture business. He was the sole proprietor of the Stagger Funeral Home until 1957, when the business was sold. In 1961, Harry became a registered real estate salesman, obtained his broker's license and an FRI degree. He opened his own brokerage, Stagger Real Estate, in Cambridge in 1974 and retired in 1994. Harry served as president of the Cambridge Association of Realtors in 1974. Harry always proudly claimed Hespler as his hometown and gave back to his community in many different ways. The real estate board, service clubs, and church committees. He was an active member of the Hespler Business Improvement Association and received the first Burt Bond Award for service to the community from the Chamber of Commerce. <coughs> Harry was the president of the chamber in 1975. Harry Steger was one of 14 community leaders, city staff, and elected officials to visit Japan in the early 1980s to encourage Toyota motor manufacturing to build in Cambridge. Toyota's announcement in December of 1985 of their plans to build in Cambridge would ultimately provide employment for thousands. A man of faith, his church meant a great deal to Harry. He worked on many church committees and sang in the choirs for 40 years. Through a program for unwed mothers initiated by his church, he along with his wife Gay opened their home in Hesper to provide a safe family environment to these women until the birth of their child. In honor of Harry's service to his country during World War II, Stagger Place is named in his memory. Harry Steger was a man of integrity and compassion. His greatest love and devotion was to his family. Mr. Steger passed away in May 26, 2013. And we have with us tonight as widow Gay and his daughter Pat. Would you please come forward? Our last inductee for this evening is Ross Anderson. He was born in, uh, in Toronto in 1927 and became an accomplished sketch and watercolor artist as a young man. And from 1947 to 1956, he earned a Bachelor and Master's of Architecture at the University of Toronto. 1955, he married Catherine Margaret Stewart, a ballerina with the National Ballet of Canada, with whom he would spend the next 61 years. From 1958 to 1972, he taught architecture at the University of Kansas and Laval University. In 1956, he started an architectural practice that would last most of his life. He devoted his career to heritage preservation of historic buildings, developing an expertise in restoring and renovating historic architecture in Quebec and Atlantic Canada. He designed national pavilions for Morocco and United Arab Emirates for Expo 67. From 1977 to 1992, he worked for the Canadian Park Services at Environment Canada in Ottawa as a senior restoration architect. 
He managed the restoration of national historic landmarks on federal lands across the country. He was a contributor of articles and drawings to the Ottawa Field Naturalist Journal and creator of a regular comic entitled This Old House for Century Home Magazine. In 1992, he moved to Cambridge and became involved in many local efforts to preserve and celebrate historical architecture, participating in local heritage committees and the Cambridge and North Dumfries Community Foundation. He created an inventory of local heritage properties and was involved in the Heritage House Tour program. He played a key role in the creation of the Trinity Church Labyrinth. And today we have his widow, Catherine Anderson. Would you please come forward? Yes. Thank you, Councillor Reed. I am delighted to receive this honor in place of my husband, and I would particularly like to thank Sheila O'Donovan, who per persisted in presenting his name for this award. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Councillor Reed, and congratulations to the four new inductees and to all their family and friends. Uh, wonderful uh, accomplishment and a great honor to be in the Cambridge Sports Hall of Fame. So let's just give them one more round of applause, everyone. That was wonderful. <laughs> We're just going to do another or second presentation, and then after that, it's a short presentation. I know there's a lot of individuals there who may want to leave, so after this short presentation, uh, we'll have about a five-minute break. Um, our second presentation is going to be done by Mayor Craig, who's going to present um, uh, the 2017 recipient of the Bill Strzok Memorial Award, and then we'll take a, a short recess. Also. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to ask uh, Tristan Hopkins uh, if he in the crowd here. Come on up, please. This is for the Bill Strzok Award. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the award because I think it's really important. Uh, Bill Strzok was a former councillor in the city of Cambridge. He was a councillor in the 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, right through to the 90s. And he was a good friend of mine. He was 20 years my senior. And we had become good friends over the years for I don't know what uh, inexplicable reason, but there was a certain glue, certain philosophy that we had. And Bill was very, uh, very rooted to the grassroots of Cambridge and well respected and really cared about the community and the people. I uh, knew him uh, for that period of time, but Bill was also known as a war veteran. He was a tail gunner in the Second World War. And I used to, when I was teaching, I would invite Bill in to talk on Remembrance Day about uh, why we shouldn't have wars. And he would come in and he would talk to the kids and nothing to glorify what it was all about. But, you know, he told me some of the stories. And one of them was about how many, I asked him one day, how many missions did you go on? Oh, he said, I went on 14 and a half. I said, well, what do you mean 14 and a half? He said, well, we got shot down. And he got shot down, and he made his way back through uh, enemy lines in France to the Allies. And he always wore this little caterpillar on his jacket, which was a symbol of those people that did that. He was a person you would never have expected to have done something like that. But what came out of all that was a great man in the city who was quiet, who had no command of English whatsoever, would turn to me at times and he would say, you guys have got to do things better in this city and things like that. And I always remember that. And he was a dear man who really loved his city, loved his community, served his country, and served the city of Cambridge. And one of the things that Bill really focused on and what was important to him was the youth of, the Cam of Cambridge. And he always talked about it, how we needed to do more for youth. And when we did pass, we decided that we would have a small scholarship that we would give out yearly to a youth in our community that was well-deserving. And Bill would be very proud. We've done this a number of times. And Tristan Hopkins is our, our nominee tonight who is going to be receiving the Bill Strzok Award. And I'm just going to read a little bit about Tristan. And what's interesting, you know, we had a whole group of people here who represented somewhat of the past in the Hall of Fame. And Tristan represents the future, really, in terms of the type of individual he is, what he's accomplished at a very early age, and where he's going in life, and certainly will be contributing to society in general. He uh, attends the Waterloo Regional School Board, Galt Collegiate. Tristan has volunteered with the City of Cambridge, Galt Collegiate Institute, and the Egg ID Exchange, just to name a few. He was also a nominee for the Bernice Adams Ward, and he had the opportunity to travel for his school. Tristan gives back to the community whenever he can by providing leadership, guidance, expertise whenever possible. Tristan is not afraid to lend a helping hand. 
Though being a member of Cambridge's Youth Advisory Committee, Committee Council, Tristan brings ideas, issues, and suggestions to the table to build a better youth experience for the City of Cambridge. And some of the events that Tristan has volunteered in are includes the City of Cambridge Youth Advisory Committee, Thursday night, uh, the Paddle Fest, uh, ID Exchange, and many others. Tristan is described as outgoing, passionate, positive, pleasant, and good natured. That should win him a lot of awards right off the top. And his courteous demeanor is appreciated by all that know him. So tonight I'm very pleased, and on behalf of Bill, a good friend, a dear friend, a uh, uh, a wonderful contributor to the city of Cambridge. It's very, it's a pleasure for me, Tristan, to present you with the uh, Bill Struck, Struck Scholarship Award. Thank you very much. There's a check. There's a check here. Come on up here. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Mayor Craig, and congratulations, Tristan. That's quite the accomplishment at such a young age. Uh, that's tremendous. We're just going to take, I know some people would like, probably would like to get going. They have busy lives. So we're just going to take a short recess uh, for a few minutes, and then we'll return. So if those people need to get going, they can, they can go. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I got off. I'm gonna turn it off. Can you do that? Did you bring it 
chair. Or I can yeah, I can get one. I'll take that one. No, but I don't. I can't look at the back and the front at the same time, right? Okay, our next order of business is uh, we have a motion regarding the Bill Struck Memorial Scholarship, and I believe uh, Councillor Mann has that motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have that motion, and it's moved by myself, seconded by uh, Mayor Doug Craig. Uh, Bill Struck Scholarship for 2017, and the recommendation is that the committee recommend to Council that the 2017 Bill Struck Memorial Scholarship Fund report be received for information. Any questions or comments uh, from the committee? Seeing none. Okay. All, uh, all in favor? Okay. Passes unanimously. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, our next uh, order on the agenda will be a presentation, which is going to be done by Sherry Roberts, who is the chair of the Accessibility Advisory Committee, and this is regarding. Uh, AODA training. So welcome, Sherry, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. It's actually uh, Dan Lejoie and I doing the presentation, so he'll be doing the initial introduction. Oh, okay. Yeah. The AODA became law on June 13, 2005, and Ontario thus became the first province in Canada to pass legislation and to develop mandatory accessibility standards. The Act aims to identify and remove pre and prevent barriers for people with disabilities in the key areas of daily living. And the goal is ultimately to have a completely accessible Ontario by 2025. The AODA legislation has made me and my colleagues aware of physical barriers in the workplace, 
which has made it possible for us to remove those barriers in order to make our public spaces safe and welcoming for all customers. This is a quote from Rosemary Manella. Um, and so what does the Accessibility Advisory Committee do? So an AAC advises municipal councils on the requirements and the implementation of Ontario's accessibility standards. So according to the law, municipalities with 10,000 or more residents must establish an Accessibility Advisory Committee. And the majority of those committee members must be individuals living with a disability. The AODA has allowed me to be actively involved in the community by requiring all businesses to improve their accessibility by increasing their understanding of the needs of people who live with disabilities. And this quote was actually from me. <laughs> and a lot of you here know that I love sidewalks and I've been here a number of times talking about sidewalks. And so of course I brought a lovely picture of my son and I strolling down this beautiful, wide, lovely, accessible sidewalk. <laughs> Being a parent of a child with a physical disability carries many financial, physical, and emotional burdens. As a working parent, it is very difficult to find camps that are interesting, fun, and affordable for my child due to his physical disability. The City of Cambridge has made this very easy. They offer a wide variety of camps that include fantastic outings each week. They gather specific information about how to include my child and to learn his strengths and weaknesses. They assign a specific person to help him be included in all the activities of the camps. I never have to worry that he's being looked after and engaged in lots of fun activities. Sincerely, Elaine Brown, the mother of a child involved in city camps. So the AODA is broken down into five standards. They are the customer service standard, information and communication standard, employment standard, transportation, and the design of public spaces.
The next standard is the information and communication standard. So consider for a moment that all the things that you've done today that have involved communicating with others or giving and receiving information. So the information and communication standard encompasses accessible website and web content, feedback processes, emergency procedures, plans, or public safety information, and accessible formats and communication supports. The transportation standard establishes the requirements that will prevent and remove barriers to make it easier for people to travel in Ontario. The AODA has required cab drivers and other service industry workers to learn about the needs of the disabled community. And this is from our friend Tom who sits on our committee as well. The design of public spaces standard. Now this is often what people think of when they think of accessibility, so things like removing physical barriers like um, giant things in front of our faces. <laughs> um, so accessible public spaces make it easier for people with disabilities to move through and use the environment around them. So the requirements of the standard are divided into seven sections. Recreational trails and beaches, outdoor public use eating areas like those found at rest stops or picnic areas, outdoor play spaces which we have a number of here in the city of Cambridge, um, exterior paths of travel, sidewalks, my friends, and walkways, and their associated elements such as ramps, stairs, curb ramps, rest areas, accessible pedestrian signals, accessible off-street and on-street parking spaces, which some of you may have noticed we have some lovely on-street parking that's come into accessible parking, come into our city recently. Obtaining services like service counters, fixed queuing guides and waiting areas, as well as maintenance planning. So during our meetings with youth in our community, we have noted that they are pleased to have easier physical access to community programs and buildings. This has also allowed us to have more widespread recommendations from staff to engage youth in programs as physical barriers are not a constant hindrance to participation. And this is from Paola Zimmer. She's a client service manager at Cambridge and SPOT Teams Kids Ability. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Sherry and Dan, and uh, we do have a few questions uh, from the committee members. Uh, first off, uh, Councillor Devine. Thank you for coming and doing the present presentation. Very, very well done, very well thought out. But a lot of it's not what you had written down, it's what you said from your heart. And I hope people are listening, I really do. Thank you, Councillor Devine. Well done. well done. And we've appreciated all your support. Councillor Devine sits on our committee with us and he's been uh, very, very helpful in implementing many of the changes we've seen in the city. So we appreciate your support as well. <laughs> uh, Councillor Wolf. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, is there any area that you think that we could, should be concentrating on that we're not? Anything that comes to mind that is most needed?
Um, what I would say is taking into account disability when you're planning for anything. So making it a, you know, a proactive approach rather than waiting until after you've done something and then having to go and try and you know, make it accessible afterwards. So keeping that in mind when you're planning buildings and any renovations, um, as well as policy creation, documents, if it's done right from the beginning, then we don't have to go back afterwards to make it accessible. So I think that it's all about making it a part of the mindset more than anything. And once you have that in your mind, then you know, a lot of the barriers are, are gone anyways. Thank you. I Absolutely, and that's another thing. If any, if anyone's ever faced with, uh, you know, some sort of challenge and they have questions about accessibility, we are we are there to be a resource. Absolutely. So if you ever have, you know, any issues or any questions, bring them to us. We'd be happy to, to help you out any way we can. I know I've appreciated um, some site visits with you, Sherry. Uh, things that I never thought of, and actually, you said you hadn't thought of until you were a soccer mom, mm -hmm. and just, you know, if your son is or daughters playing in the far field and to get you know, there's grass but to be able to to manipulate a wheelchair through that long uh, field is is a barrier and uh, so you know those kinds of things um, you know that we when we're planning a field or planning uh, bleachers or any of those things are, are something we can take into consideration but again, thank you for the presentation and thank you for um, the advice that you've uh, given us so far. Uh, Councillor Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, uh, thanks for the presentation. It's, it's uh, always good to hear and to get the feedback from you in relation to how we're doing in the city. And uh, I didn't realize how significant small cracks in a sidewalk were until I think Sherry, you brought it to our attention a couple of years ago, and it's like it's like driving and driving your car, and all you hit is a pothole. And every time we hit a pothole, we feel that, and we get we get irritated by it. But every three feet on a sidewalk, there's there's a crack. And so if those are out of line with each other, then you feel that significantly every single step that you take. And so for me, it's been it's been uh, very educational as far as those little things that make such a big difference. So. It's very important that you keep coming back to us and reporting to us and helping us to make wise decisions about what we can do in the future to make your travels that much easier. So thank you for coming in. Thank you for that. Okay, I see uh, no further speakers, but um, I'd really like to thank uh, and applaud Sherry and Dan and the Accessibility Advisory Committee for all their efforts to increase accessibility and awareness for those with mobility issues in our community. I know on a personal note, uh, with my recent health and mobility issues, this has really made me much more aware. Uh, prior to this, you never really gave, I never gave much thought to it, to be honest with you, but it's really opened my eyes a lot. And uh, it made me aware of how mobility issues can be very challenging and frustrating for individuals who do not have full mobility. It has made me very aware as a society, we've come a long way, and especially in Cambridge, we've done a good job rectifying mobility challenges, but we still have a long way to go. I know last summer I went out to um, I went out to a beach, not in Cambridge, but close by out on Highway 8, um, and um, Valens, that's it, Valens. And uh, I was in a wheelchair at the time, and just trying to get from, just trying to get down, it was all grass. You couldn't get down to the beach or to the area, and stuff like that, it really opens your eyes. So I really applaud everything you do. And a question I had for you, Tisha. I know um, I emailed you, and uh, I was wondering how are you making out. We had the you had the uh, ramps for downtown businesses and restaurants. How's that? How's that going? Yeah, we're okay. actually at a at a really exciting part of it. So the, all the legal stuff is now dealt with, and we're getting ready to uh, go out and take measurements and start some builds. So we have eight businesses lined up, um, which will be fully funded by the stopgap ramp uh, organization. Is going to pay for those first eight ramps for us. And we're looking for more participants. So if you know of any businesses in town that have a step of eight inches or less, a one step up, um, feel free to, to send their information my way. I'd be happy to go out and chat with them about the program. So it's pretty exciting. We're going to be able to get people into more of our businesses. Awesome. Thank, thanks. thanks so much, Sherry and Dan. Thank you. Thank you.
Jenkins. Great, thanks. And just to, sorry, just to, before we close up, you will be receiving some more information about the AODA from Heather Milo. She'll be sending it out shortly. And if you have any questions after reviewing that, then and please forward them to us. Thank you. Okay, next uh, on our agenda, we have three delegations this evening. And I'd just like to remind our speakers there's a, a five minute uh, time limit on your time you can speak. So, uh, our first uh, delegation is Allison Hathaway from St. Luke's Place regarding long term care. Oh, for, for what? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. We'll go next. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, you're right. Um, sorry, it's Allison Hathaway from St. Luke's Place regarding long term care home redevelopments. Um, so Allison, if you could come uh, forward, please. And Brian, yes, okay. I didn't have you down here, Brian, actually, so, okay. Thank you kindly. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I'm not Allison. My name is Brian Swainson. I'm Chief Executive Officer at St. Luke's Place here in Cambridge. Um, and I'm here tonight uh, with, with my delegation uh, partners to talk about the St. Luke's Place Redevelopment Project. I'd first like to introduce the other members of our delegation represented tonight. Uh, first is Bob Pettit. Bob is the chair of our redevelopment committee of the board of directors at St. Luke's Place and a very long serving board member at St. Luke's Place. Uh, Allison Hathaway is our director of donor relations and fund development, St. Luke's Place Foundation, and it's Allison's job to spearhead our capital campaign, which has been underway for a little bit over a year now. And Stacy Bartlett, who is our operations director and long-term care redevelopment project manager, very recently joining St. Luke's Place from the Waterloo Wellington Lynn. There we are. I thought I would start by giving just a little bit of information about St. Luke's Place. We are a charitable, nonprofit, accredited long term care facility in seniors' community. It became a reality of the result of a desire to serve seniors in the Cambridge community. Uh, on our seven acres, uh, and almost seven acres in uh, Hespler, we have services and accommodations in the areas of long term care. We have a small retirement home. We have two independent living apartment buildings for seniors, and we also operate a, an elderly person center community program. Some quick facts. Uh, we had our 40th anniversary of service to the community last September, which was a wonderful open house, and a few folks tonight, I, I see here tonight, actually attended that open house. We have uh, approximately 200 dedicated staff, and we have over 300 uh, residents and tenants on our campus of care. Uh, annually, we benefit from uh, approximately 4,000 volunteer hours, which is wonderful, folks from the community. And of course, our board of directors is comprised of skilled, dedicated community volunteers. Regarding our redevelopment project, I've gotten this question quite often over the past couple of years. Why are we redeveloping? Just a little bit of background. In 2014, the Ontario government announced their plan to redevelop approximately 300 long-term care homes in the province. That's roughly 50% of the long-term care homes in the province need to be redeveloped, completed, and done by the year 2025. So it's quite a staggering number when you think about how many long-term care homes are to go through this process. Redevelopment is mandatory under provin provincial legislation. And over the past two years, the St. Luke's Place Board of Directors has built its redevelopment plan for creating a revitalized long-term care home to better meet the needs and expectations of the residents we are privileged to serve their families and the community for generations to come. Our seniors come first. This slide, we have an arch architect's rendering of our current plan for our new facility. Uh, this image is also in the handout packages that have been provided to all of you this evening. And it's really about meeting uh, the changing needs and, and complex care needs of our aging population. 
addressing the needs and desires of residents, families, and the community for generations to come. And we hope to, and we are, a sector leader uh, as a model of excellent care to the community. This image is also on our website. Various versions of it, as it has developed over the past couple of years, have been posted to our website for the community's information. Uh, you might wonder, what makes St. Luke's Place unique? Well, a couple of points when it comes to uh, redevelopment and long-term care. We are the only nonprofit long-term care home in Cambridge and North Dumfries to be redeveloped through this provincial strategy. We are also the only standalone charitable long-term care home in all of Waterloo, Wellington to proceed with a long-term care redevelopment project. There are many important and unique differences in the care that we provide as a non-profit long-term care home. There is a brochure also in your handout package that talks about the not-for-profit difference in senior services, but I'll touch on uh, just five points uh, in tonight's presentation. The first is our, our reinvestment in care. So as a nonprofit operator in long-term care, St. Luke's Place does not have owners. We do not have shareholders. We are govern, governed by a volunteer board of directors of community members. What that means is that we are able to re reinvest in ourselves. We reinvest by adding additional staff hours. We reinvest by keeping our equipment up to date, making sure that we have proper equipment and supplies at all times. And we also invest in innovation. The second point relates to the third point, first point. Uh, it's, it's very well established that staffing levels impact the quality of care that's provided. You just have to do a couple of quick Google searches and you can find all sorts of research that tells you that the more staffing hours in a long-term care home, the better quality of care that's provided. And continuing that theme, focus on quality improvement. Just as an example about some of our innovation at St. Luke's Place, in the year 2014, the province asked long-term care homes to voluntarily participate in a quality improvement plan program, which was eventually de to become mandatory in future years. St. Luke's Place was one of only 90 homes that submitted a voluntary quality improvement plan that year, and it helped to sort of set the stage for the mandatory pro program over the next few years, which we still continue to participate in. The demand for long-term care services, this is a very interesting one. You know, St. Luke's Place currently has 114 long-term care beds. Our wait list as of today, hot off the presses, we have 180 names on our wait list for long-term care at St. Luke's Place. 180. And it's very interesting. I speak a fair bit for Advantage Ontario, which represents many nonprofit homes across the province. And it's, it's uh, for quite a number of years now, nonprofit and municipal homes it's, uh, the statistics are that we have the, the fewest long-term care beds in the province, yet we have the lion's share of the wait list. You know, you can talk about quality indicators and quality measures and all that other stuff, but really if you just look at the wait list demand for nonprofit operators, that is where the general public trusts their loved ones to be placed. The last point, local accountability and strong community support. In addition to our volunteer board, which I've spoken about, we, we have for many years have benefited from the support of many community groups, the local legions, many service clubs, individuals and families. Now a couple of points about our redevelopment plan itself. It's quite exciting that we are focusing on building the capacity of our long-term care home with the intention of growing to accommodate 165 residents. So we're looking for a little bit over 50 beds to add to our complement, and that's a roughly 50% increase to what we currently um, hold today. And this is really to better meet the current and future care needs of our local community. On the point of growth, the next slide, uh, again, you just have to do a quick Google search over the past nine months. You can find quite a few examples of other communities in Ontario which are possibly facing the loss of long-term care capacity in their community. So I've given a couple of examples here. The Brantford community, Perth County, Markdale, Clarington, um, and I believe that there will be more as the next few years go on. Now, the loss of capacity is to a particular town or to a particular city, it's not province-wide. But the fact is that as homes and, and some chain homes start to look at redevelopment, they, they, there's a desire to do a little bit of amalgamation and that does mean that some homes may shut down in uh, certain communities to amalgamate with a larger home in a, in a neighboring community. But that, that's the very reason that we're very excited about looking at the growth for, for St. Luke's Place because we hope to be part of the solution for the Cambridge community. From a service perspective, we currently have four long-term care beds which are categorized as veterans priority access beds. And these veterans priority access beds will continue in our new facility. 
Where our, new plan, our plan also includes one or more dedicated dementia care units. We currently have one dementia care unit at St. Luke's Place, and it is always fully occupied. There is great demand for this. And our plan to include one or two dementia care units in our new facility really aligns with the provincial dementia care strategy. Uh, lastly, we're pursuing other um, specialized care services possibilities in our, in our long-term care redevelopment project. Um, partnerships. We're, committing to, we're committed to working with other community partners and organizations to de further develop the community of care at St. Luke's Place for the benefit of the local community. So we are not only building a brand new, um, sorry, my slide moved ahead. We're not only looking forward to building a brand new facility to meet current design standards for long-term care, but we are looking at options to make use of uh, one or two buildings which may become vacant out of this process. And there's all sorts of opportunities there. I've spoken with neighborhood associations and daycares. We're in discussions with community health centers, adult day programs, and a variety of community service agencies, all of whom are eager to look at potential space possibilities once our redevelopment project is done. Our board of directors has, has established and followed a set of guiding principles in putting together our plan. We are committed to avoiding and minimizing disruption and inconvenience to our long-term care residents throughout this project. So for our project, we will not require the temporary relocation of long-term care residents off-site and we will not require temporary closure of long-term care beds. And we're very pleased about that because some projects are struggling with those, those possibilities. And throughout the project, and part of the approval process with the ministry, is that we have to ensure that we will continue to provide excellent care to our residents in a welcoming, clean and, home, clean and safe home environment each and every day throughout the entirety of the project. Our plan timeline, uh, we were given our official letter from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in January 2015, which signaled that we are a part of this strategy. We've been planning since that time, so two and a half years now. And just earlier this month, we submitted our formal plan to the Ministry of Health for approval. We're told that the approval process can take many months, so we're not quite sure when the approvals will come through. But our plan right now calls to break ground in the year 2019. A year and a half later, the first phase of our new facility will be open and occupied, and a year and a half after that, the second phase of our facility will be open and occupied. Our board of directors made the decision to do our, our project in two phases to help avoid the need to possibly look at moving residents off-site. So that two-phase approach really works well. There is a cost to that. Our project, uh, there's, a, there's a, a cost to doing it in two phases. That cost is roughly $1 million. But our board of directors has been quite adamant that for a million dollars it's worth doing it in two phases so that we will minimize those disruptions. I just wanted to outline some of the community supporters that we've had for quite a long time. Um, you know, I've mentioned Lions Clubs, many, many community service groups here, the Legions, residents, staff, volunteers, and the list goes on. Sorry, Ryan, you're almost, uh, almost done? I'm on my last slide. Okay, okay, great. Okay, thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. Uh, our request tonight in coming here is really on behalf of St. Luke's Place, we are here to respectfully request that the City of Cambridge provides a letter to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in support of our long-term care redevelopment project. And I do note here that further details about our organization and about our redevelopment project have been provided in your handout package as well. Uh, anytime you want to take a look at our website, we've kept a lot of information on there the past two years. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, do any members of the committee have any questions for Brian? Councillor DeMai? Yeah. Oh, Councillor Reed, sorry. Yeah, okay. Cool. Sorry, she was in front of you, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, you mentioned that you have 180 uh, people on your wait list. And I want to thank you, first of all, though, for your presentation because it, it it's very helpful us to really understand what's going on, and I really support the nonprofit. But with 180 on your wait list, how long do you anticipate it would be if, for someone uh, like that wait list to be reduced to, well, let's say zero, if it possibly ever would be? 
Uh, we, we get that question a lot, how quickly does our wait list move and what can be done to possibly move along the wait list a bit faster. The uh, Lynn and, and Community Care Access Centre, which are now merged, they really manage that wait list for all long-term care homes in the province. And their, their assessment process and how quickly you move up that list is basically uh, according to your assessed care needs. So the more urgent your assessed care needs become, the system will move you up that wait list a little bit faster. Uh, I cannot foresee, at least during the rest of my career, that we will ever have zero names left on our wait list. But certainly by our 50% expansion, we should make a bit of a dent in that list. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Uh, Councillor Devine. Uh, through the Chair, Brian, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you've shown great leadership here. Your team, your management team, and the board of directors are showing fantastic leadership here. This is, uh, it's been well thought of, well planned. Um, and do I have to make a motion to uh, the city send a letter in support? Uh, that's correct, Councillor DeMine. I was going to mention that after, after everybody's done speaking, but if you want to put that motion forward and get a second or that. Well, I, no, I think we'll just wait till, till, wait till the speaker, Brian sure. sits down, sure. and then I can make the motion after the questions. Or sure, something. sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And well done. Well Thank done. you very much, Councillor Devine. Councillor Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, thanks for the presentation, Brian. I know that uh, myself and other councillors have had the opportunity to meet with uh, Allison and, and have an update on what's going on, and the background information that has been provided to us has been very helpful in, in understanding what's going on and, and the need for long-term uh, long care beds and how they have to meet an A category and all those things. So it's been very informative, very helpful. And uh, I really appreciate that. I know you have more than just long-term care uh, beds at uh, St. Luke's. Can you tell me how many retirement uh, facilities you have there, or how many retirement uh, units you have there? Yes, we have. We currently have 30 retirement uh, suites, so we are on the small side for a retirement home, and we have 132 independent living apartments. So in total, we have between 300 and 320 seniors living under our five roofs. Wow. And uh, St. Luke's is, is so well renowned across the across the city, and uh, that's because of the leadership, as Councillor Devine has said, by the staff and the and the leadership team and the uh, and the board of directors. So thank you for what you do for our community, for our leaders, for our for the for our seniors who have been leaders in our community for so long, and uh, and uh, the way in which you look after them and help them in their golden years. Thank you, Councillor Mann. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Councillor Devine, are you going to move the motion that uh, we get the city send a letter to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in support of St. Luke's? Okay. I would so move that that okay. uh, the city support. Actually, I think coming from the mayor would be the most appropriate, to be honest with you. Would you like to move that motion, Mayor Craig? No, I meant the letter. The letter, yeah. Well, I, I've already discussed this with St. Luke's that, in fact, I would provide a letter. I think that formally and officially, we should have a motion on the Absolutely. floor by Councillor Devine. And uh, I've already uh, have met with St. Luke's officials about this. Okay. In my pleasure. Okay. Good. Seconded by uh, Councillor Leggett. Okay. All those in favor? Passes unanimously. And, and thanks, uh, Brian. Thanks for your presentation. Um, just on a personal note, I know what my mom lives there in the in the independent living suites. Is there any plan to increase your uh, independent living suites or our non-care apartments, or is it just the long-term care? Well, that's an interesting question because, as I mentioned during my talk, uh, we will have one, if not two, buildings vacant by the end of this project, and there's a broad spectrum of possibilities with those two buildings. One of which is to look at a more affordable housing for seniors create sort of a mini uh, community service and health care hub. There's all sorts of possibilities. I've been in talks with the region of Waterloo for a year and a half on the, on the affordable housing front. But really, until we can get our main project approved, the future of our soon-to-be vacated buildings is uh, we've got our options ready, but we can't act on those until we get our approval. Okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I just want to know what, being there as my mom lives there, I just want to say you have a great reputation. You do a great job serving the seniors in, in our community. So uh, best of luck in your redevelopment efforts for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Our uh, second delegation is uh, David Jerome. 
and Davis would like to speak to us regarding our city fencing bylaw. Uh, welcome, David. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Can you, uh, No luck. Sorry, no luck. I'm David Jerome and I live at 67 Fair Lake Drive here in the city of Cambridge. I'm here before you this evening to respectfully request an amendment to section six of the fence bylaw number 9205. If you could refer to my correspondence on pages 162 and 163. I'd like to draw your attention to the two pictures which I've submitted showing a snow fence bordering the back of my property. The snow fence is located in a zone designated as open space. And also if you look at uh, my correspondence on page 160, it talks about in section six, snow fencing in particular may, may not be used as a permanent fence in any zone where the word residential appears in the applicable zoning bylaw within the area of the city. As section six currently stands, it only prohibits the permanent use of snow fencing in a residential zone. This means that the fence I'm speaking about would be allowed to remain standing year round as it is located in a, in a zone designated as open space. Open space zone is virtually surrounded by residential properties and all of the properties are located within the area of the city. And there is a, a, a map showing the layout of the uh, properties on 161. I believe to be fair to all residents within the area of the city that the following amendment to section six of the fence bylaw should be allowed. The amendment could state, for example, the following wording. Snow fencing may be used as, may not be used as a permanent fence in any zone within the area of the city. I believe my request for this change is well founded. For example, in the fence bylaw, there are def definitions of various types and styles of fences. By definition, in the bylaw, it states that a snow fence shall mean a fence commonly used for the control of snow. This is shown on page 160. This clearly implies that a snow fence is a fence intended for use during the winter season, not a fence to be used as a permanent barrier. And I'd also like to draw your attention to section 10 of the fence bylaw. It in part states that nothing shall prevent the construction and maintenance of a farm fence in agricultural, rural, residential, or open space zones as defined by the applicable zoning bylaw. So section 10 of the existing fence bylaw clearly states that a farm fence is the type of fence one should be using if in fact someone wishes to permanently place a fence in a zone designated as open space. To summarize, I just wish to say that what I stated here this evening is meant to introduce some fairness to this situation. What I've proposed does not completely prohibit the use of snow fencing in an open space zone. It would only restrict its use to the winter months or perhaps at other times when there's construction and to surround a construction site, for instance. But even in that instance, it would only be as a temporary measure. It also points out that for a permanent type of fence, farm fencing should be used to enclose an open space zone as per section 10 of the existing fence bylaw. So I thank you all for your consideration to the changes I've proposed and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer it. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Councillor DeMine. Uh, just a question, that fence that's there, how long has it been laying there? It was placed there mid-March of this year. There is some construction that's going to happen in the residential zone of that property and it has started but the fence is in the open space zone which is several yards away from the residential construction. So in my point of view that particular type of fence doesn't belong in an open space zone. There's no construction allowed in the open space zone. It should be around the end, excuse me, around the envelope of the building site Okay, is this the same, like you kept referring to the snow fence, is this the same fence that you use for safety fence? Same, same type of fence? Uh, it, it could be, but 
um, if you if you looked at the Home Depot, for instance, in their website, and you look up snow fencing, this is the type of fence they show, a plastic orange fence, as seen in the pictures here and on page uh, 162, 163. Well, it just looks to me like the same stuff I would use for a safety fence if I had a construction job. Maybe it's different, I don't know. I think both applications, it could be used in both applications, but in this particular instance, it is in an open space zone and construction is prohibited in, in an open space zone. It doesn't quite make sense to me that it's several hundred yards away from where the actual construction is taking place and there's no fence around that part of the property, but it's around a, a piece of land that construction is prohibited. Uh, Councilor Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Jerome. This fence, is this uh, a divide between you and a neighbor? Is, is, can you put it into context for me? It's, it does uh, ride along the back of the property line, but it is on the neighbor's property. So his property actually consists of an open space zone and a residential zone. And would yours be the next neighboring property? Uh, we back on to, to that property. There's approximately 20 homes that surround this open space area. Thanks. Um, yeah. So as I said, I'm not um, trying to restrict the use of that type of fence completely. It's just um, making it for use for what it's intended for, which is in the, in the winter as a snow fence or perhaps around a construction site. But to leave it like this, it's like, it's like an elephant in the room for us when we look <laughs> out our back window. It's, uh, it's an eyesore. It's I'm totally unnecessary. I mean, you, you want to block snow going into a, a bush area or a woodlot? Just doesn't make sense. Councillor Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But what you are asking of us seems to make a lot, a lot of sense. But I, I know we always have intended consequences, and sometimes we don't uh, realize unintended consequences of a change of things. So what I would propose we do as a council is to send this uh, back to staff uh, for some recommendations and uh, that it come back to this council as soon as possible. So okay. uh, I'd be prepared to uh, make that a motion if that's what you require, Mr. Chair. Yes, and do we have a seconder for that motion? Uh, Mayor Craig, okay. Okay, I appreciate that very much. Thank you for your consideration. Yeah, hold, hold, hold on, David. Yeah, oh. hold on. Uh, Councilor Rolf, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, first of all, if it's only been, if the fence has only been up since March, okay. it isn't a permanent fence, correct? But this is June, almost July, and it's still, still standing. I think, though, in the future, even. Um, you know, barring the fact that this may be removed, uh, there still could be other instances where it wouldn't be removed and would still be allowed to remain year-round in, in that type of situation. Okay. Um, have you spoken to the owner? Uh, they are under construction, but I, I do not. I mean, they're so far away from where, where I am. I, I don't want to enter into their property. They've put up private property signs and they don't seem to be particularly friendly, so I have not directed anything towards them. Um, and so if they use this same fence, but closer to the construction site? Well, I think that that's the intent of it. I think even in the property standards or, or in the rules for construction, in certain instances, you have to have a barrier like that around a construction site. Um, but. This particular fence is in the open space zone and construction is prohibited in that zone. So it doesn't particularly make sense to have it there. It should be, if anywhere, around where they're building. Because they're digging and whatnot and there's no fence around that area. I was thinking perhaps, and maybe this will staff suggest, we don't necessarily need to change the bylaw, but we need to address this fence and have it move closer to the construction. Um, I, I, I mean, that's one way to maybe look at it, but I still think if, if this particular wording isn't changed, then in the future you could still have this circumstance. And uh, I may be back just to ask the yeah. same thing again. I, I think, yeah, think Councillor Wolf, that's something we'll ask for staff for direction in that regard. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
I appreciate it. Thank you. And Councillor Leggett? Okay. I know what we're doing here. We'll cover everything. Okay. Um, just a, a, a comment myself. I don't see any further speakers. I know David is a constituent of mine. I went to see um, went to see him. I, I checked the backyard here, and um, it's really made a mess of his backyard and an enjoyment of his backyard. There's no trespassing signs. There's really no need for this snow fence because it's... Consider it. And... Uh, yeah. So I think... An unjustified, really. Yeah. So I think, you know, this is... A, I think this is something we could look at. Maybe Hardy would like to speak to this. But it's something I think we've put... We've got a motion on the floor to, to ask staff to look... Uh, direction from staff to report back to us. So um, is there anything you'd like to add, Hardy, before we move on? Okay. I'd just like to also say we do have a beautiful neighborhood with the bush around it. And we thoroughly enjoyed living at this house, but when this fence was put up, it's just spoiled it for us. It's basically just blocking. There's no, there's no construction. There's there. no consideration just, really for the neighbors. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't do this to so, our neighbor. It's just very inconsiderate. And uh, yeah, so I think an unjustified really. Yeah. So I think you know this is a, I think this is something we could look at. Maybe Hardy would like to speak to this, but it's something I think we've put. We got a motion on the floor to, to ask staff to look. Uh, direction from staff to report back to us. So, um, is there anything you'd like to add, Hardy, before we move on? Okay. I'd just like to also say we do have a beautiful neighborhood with the bush around it, and we've thoroughly enjoyed living at this house. But when this fence was put up, it's just spoiled it for us. Cer certainly, staff can uh, review options here and, and we can have a look at the, the term permanent, we can look at uh, option as, as being proposed um, and I would suggest that if you do give, a, give staff some time to review some of those things and we can report back to general committee. Okay, okay thank, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you David. Um, I, I think appreciate I'd, it. I'd like to call the question. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor to get staff direction and report back to us. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, carries unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our final uh, delegation uh, is Sean Kerriger from the Cambridge Rotary uh, Rib Fest, which is uh, occurring August 11th to 13th at Riverside Park. So uh, welcome, Sean. Your Worship, uh, councillors, um, city staff, uh, thanks for having me back. Uh, most of you were aware that I presented two weeks ago about Ribfest, so I won't uh, go into that. Um, Mayor Craig's recommendation was for me to meet with Councillor Mann, which occurred last week, and we discussed some options. So as a result, I'm here to ask for a sponsorship from the city for $1,250 to help with Ribfest. Um, Councillor Mann, do you need me to, is there any questions on what, I'd, on what the sponsorship would cover? Well, what we do is with Ribfest is we do fundraise and we uh, Cambridge North Rotary and Cambridge Sunrise uh, fundraises and we distribute the funds through the city and into the community at large. Uh, Ribfest is our single largest fundraising activity for the two clubs. Uh, we have some questions uh, from the committee. Uh, Councillor uh, Mann? Oh, Leggett, Councillor Leggett, sorry. Okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, that didn't quite answer what the sponsorship money would be used for. And if I remember you coming last time, um, you talked about how much money is made through Ribfest. It seems that to me, my memory uh, serves me right, that there's quite a substantial amount of profit that was made by Ribfest. So I'd like to know what the actual need is need is from uh, the taxpayers and also what would you use it for? Well, so the, the profits at GRI from Ribfest come from three sources. There's sponsorship is our number one source of, of fundraising. Um, the second one is actual donations and, and the third one is through the, the vendor sales. So we require to achieve what we did last year, we require to, we're required to um, canvas for sponsorships. And that's a big part of it. This year's sponsorships, we've had a few people pull out. So we're looking for people to replace those sponsorships so that we can even just uh, make the same amount of money as we did last year. Now, understanding that Ribfest is not 
I, I use the term profit and making money. We don't actually absorb, or pardon me, we don't actually um, make money. The club doesn't retain any of the money. Every penny that Ribfest generates gets disseminated back out into the community. Some of that can go to uh, uh, the food bank. It can end up in... Um, it can end up with kids' ability. It could end up at a local family that requires um, accessibility into their house. They would petition us, and we would turn around and provide them funds for that. Uh, we have just donated a substantial amount of money to Haven House just two weeks ago, um, and it was in the neighborhood of thirty thousand dollars was the size of the check that we distributed. We uh, we gave them. So that's the type of things that get funded from these these fundraising activities. Does that uh, assist? Councillor Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and my question is, is more for staff than for, than for Sean. And uh, if uh, Mr. Fairweather could just uh, uh, maybe give us an idea of the, if, if there's money in grants to groups that would cover this request. Through the chair to Councillor Mann, there is funding available. There was a holdback of 5% on it, so there's about $6,400. Councillor Wolf. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, a question for uh, for Kent, I believe. With grants to groups, isn't the policy we don't fund someone to fundraise? Through you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, that is uh, a measure in the policy that uh, fundraising organizations aren't eligible to receive grants to groups. have to take it so sorry I, so I assume we could I, I, I don't mind giving you the money but we may have to give it out of a different a different pot but, but that's that's fine with us um, anything, <laughs> anything in kind is is appreciated um, absolutely appreciated okay, thank you. now one of the things I'd like you to consider is as depending on the value there is a marketing aspect and uh, marketing aspect to it and we do have a deadline of June 30th to get the uh, marketing out. So if, if the, the funds are done as an in-kind, so say Mr. McVitie in-kinds some of the city expenses, we, you would still be entitled for that value in, in the marketing. And I would like to see the City of Cambridge logo in the marketing. So if there's a possibility of, of getting that worked out in time for us to get the logo onto the print media and into the, well, the electronic media is not so concerning, but the print media is. Um. Uh, Councillor Liggett. Uh, yes, it's a question for staff. What are we giving already uh, in kind, just so we know where we are here? Through you, Mr. Chair, I would have to uh, go back to staff and, and uh, do some calculations and provide that information. I don't have that readily available. I, I can um, I could answer that. Uh, at, at this point, nothing in kind from the city, but there was an evaluation done by Mr. McVitie last year that, uh, that adjusted some of the rates to accommodate a more realistic use of the, um, more realistic use of the facilities, but there was nothing actually absorbed by the city. If I don't know if you recall that conversation with Mr. Rosad and myself. Okay, at this point, um, we need to, uh, if we believe we need to uh, sponsor the Rib Fest uh, right now, we need a mover and a seconder for that. Okay, um, you want to move it, Councilor Mann? Got the motion. Oh, you got the motion? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, moved by myself, seconded by Mayor Craig. Uh, Cambridge Rotary Rib Fest, that Cambridge City Council supports the Cambridge Rotary Rib Fest and provides uh, financial support in the amount of $1,250 towards the event to be held on August 11 to 13, 2017. And if I could speak to the motion. Uh, I know that I had talked about it coming out of grants to groups and, and Councillor Wolf rightfully reminded us that uh, it wouldn't be appropriate to come out of that pot, but the money could come uh, from another pot within the city budget. No, uh, no further questions. So, uh, so it looks like we'll, uh, we'll see a uh, vote on this. All those, all those in favor of the motion. Okay, it passes unanimously. 
Okay, thank you, Sean. Thank you. I do have one more other thing I would like to ask. Um, it has nothing to do with Ribfest, actually. I think you're going to like this one, because I did bounce this off of Councillor Mann. Uh, I have had the uh, wonderful uh, pleasure of going to some Rotary meetings down in the States, where they started doing international grants, but they did them reverse. So we have a th our th natural thought is that an international grant means we send money out of the country. And they're actually, they, what they did is they brought money into Tampa. It was happened to be where I was going. So they actually did a project that was about $150,000 US in Tampa. Um, I'm really passionate about this, and I would like to do something of this, probably of this grandeur here in Cambridge, but what I'm asking you folks to do is, if you hear about it, can you send it to me? I've left my cards with Mr. Hudson, so he's got my contact information. So if you have a constituent or a group that comes up and says we want funding, in particular looking for youth and, youth and uh, families, and uh, let them know, and I'd, well, I'd like to run with it. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, we have a, a final, uh, it's a presentation on the, uh, under other business. It's uh, going to be done by Councillor Mann, and he'd like to make a presentation on the recent tragic fires in Portugal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I know, uh, James, if you could uh, get me started with the PowerPoint presentation, that'd be great. <clears throat> Councillor Montero asked me to present on his behalf this evening because he couldn't be here and uh, he, would, he would have been far more eloquent and knowledgeable on this particular issue than I am, so please forgive me as I proceed. In 1957, our brothers and sisters from Portugal arrived in Cambridge and they called this community their home. And now, 60 years later, more than 30% of our population are of Portuguese origin. And they have become an integral part of our community, the very fabric of who we are as a city, contributing in so many ways to the economic, social, industrial, technological, and spiritual growth of our community. Earlier this month, our hearts were broken as we wept with our Portuguese family over the devastating fires that occurred in Pettigrown, Portugal. Victims trying to escape the forest fires that engulfed their homes and, fam and families and farms were trapped on the only highway in and out of the impacted area. They thought they were evacu evacuating the area when in fact they were driving into the, the area in hopes of getting out. Victims trying to escape the forest fires were engulfed in their homes, their farms, uh, their vehicles, and as they tried to escape, uh, they died in their vehicles as they burned. Loved ones, family and friends of those in our community perished as the fire ravished the countryside back home. We can only imagine the suffering, the pain, the grief and the heartache that they are experiencing and we, and we mourn with them in the loss of their families and friends back in Portugal. More than 60 people have perished and homes and farms destroyed. But we stand with our friends, with our family, and we cry with them and we pray with them at this unbelievable time. Next month, the Portuguese Club of Cambridge, along with the Oriental Club, will hold a fundraiser in support of the families and victims of this disaster, the date of which is to be set. And I have a motion before me, and it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Pam Wolf in relation to the fires in Portugal, that the city of Cambridge uh, count that, city, that Cambridge City Council would provide a donation in the amount of $1,250 to the, to the victims of the forest fire in Pettigrew in support of the victims of, of the fires in Portugal. And so I would ask that we would uh, consider this because, as I said, a significant portion of our community is of Portugal, Portuguese origin, and it's our way of showing support and compassion to our community at this very difficult time. Thank you, uh, Councillor Mann. Um, do we have any speakers to this uh, motion? Go uh, seeing none. Uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Uh, passes unanimously.
Okay, the next order of business is I'd like to move on to the consent agenda. Except for items five, the multiplex site considerations, item number eight, the Riverside Dam class environmental assessment, and item number 11, the Eagle Street and Laurel Street pedestrian crossing, which have been pulled and will be considered later individually. So we're going to pass a consent agenda except for those three items we'll talk about later individually. So uh, we have, uh, uh, Councillor uh, Wolf has a consent agenda. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Reed. Consent procedure that all items listed under the heading of public consent agenda for Tuesday, Janu June 27th, 2017, public meeting agenda be adopted as recommended. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Wolf. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, passes unanimously. Um, so we're going to move on to item number five that's been pulled individually. Uh, Councillor Leggett, would you like to speak to, to this motion? Sorry? Sure. Yeah. To it. <coughs> okay. Um, move the uh, multiplex site considerations as printed. Um, I had this pulled, oh, and seconded by Councillor Devine. I had this printed, uh, pulled because when I looked at the options, I thought, um, and the wording uh, under the recommendation, it says specify, but yet uh, under the summary, it says potential. So I had concerns that uh, this might be written in stone when there might be some other options, as, such as item A may be combined with um, uh, option C. And I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be locked into something and be, regret it later. So. Uh, earlier this evening, um, 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 Mr. Um, uh, Kent, Kent McBiddy um, and I had an email exchange and uh, uh, it was uh, brought to me that these are just suggestive options and there, there are other options that may come forward by the time we have that meeting. So I want the public to understand that what you're seeing here isn't necessarily all that there could be when that time comes for us to make our decision. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, Mayor Craig. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, uh, I do agree with Councillor Leon about this. These are, in fact, suggestions. Public can come forth with other suge suggestions or combinations or whatever it may be. I mean, what we've done is we've given out all the information that was requested and as possible in terms of starting a vigorous debate. There are three months to review this, and uh, I believe the date's October the 2nd that uh, we will be making a decision on the options that will be presented and are in the report. Councillor Wolf. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I was just wondering if a little more information can be given in the future on Southeast Gulf, uh, because in the report, I don't think it identified where that was, uh, that the city already owns that land, those kinds of details. So if we're looking at it in comparison with some of the other options, just to have staff fill in those, those holes. Thank you. That's uh, so noted, Councillor Wolf. Thank you. And uh, oh, we have one more speaker, uh, Councillor Leggett. Okay. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the mayor has just stated October second, and I'm wondering is, is the recommendation still to say September, or are we to say October? Just so everybody's clear. Uh, through the chair, the minutes will reflect uh, the meeting date that we've been able to confirm, which is Monday, October second. So we'll accurately reflect that proposed date. Yeah, uh, seeing no further uh, speakers, I'd like to call the question. All those in favor? And it passes unanimously, thanks. Okay, uh, moving on, moving, <laughs> moving on to item eight, uh, the Riverside Dam class environmental assessment. Uh, Councilor Mann, you have that motion? I do, Mr. Chair, thank you. And it's moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Reed, the Riverside Dam class environmental assessment. Uh, additional work to complete the study and the recommendation is that report 17 
075 DNE regarding the Riverside Dam class environment assessment be received and that council approves the additional work as outlined in the report to complete the Riverside Dam class environment assessment and further that council approves the transfer of $90,000 from capital project 13C031 the Riverside Dam design to 09C002 structural rehabilitation through capital works revenue reserve fund as outlined in report 17075 and I'd like to speak to that motion please uh, I know council has received numerous emails in relation to this this item in the uh, in the agenda and uh, I, I just wanted to, to clarify it because I think there was some misunderstanding as to what was going to happen tonight and this isn't to make a decision about what we're going to do with the dam whether we're going to replace it or uh, repair it or, or whatever and the thing is that this is this is a, a clarification for an administration fee for the environmental assessment to be done and and for the uh, the uh, consultant to complete the survey that has been requested of stakeholders from within the community and, uh, and I just and I also want to clarify that regardless of what happens to the dam the cost to repair or the cost to replace it would not be impacted by this money coming from that from that from that uh, budget line there will always be money to do whatever needs to be done to the dam to bring it to the state that we want it to be I see no further speakers, so I'd like to call the question. Uh, all those in favor? Passes unanimously. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, item number 11 is the Eel and Laurel Street uh, pedestrian crossing. I believe, Councillor Reed, you have that motion? I do, uh, Mr. Chair. It's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Mann. The recommendation uh, is that report 17 061. D and I Eagle Street at Laurel Street pedestrian crossing be received for information. Uh, the reason that uh, I wanted to discuss this was to make it really clear that we've had some movement on a crossing there. Uh, that we originally asked for a uh, crossing or perhaps with lights or whatever in order for people to get across Eagle Street at Laurel. It's a very dangerous area. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Golden Years home there. We also have apartment buildings which house a lot of seniors or older adults. And uh, they find it very difficult to get across there. So I, I just wanted to let people know that we are going to have a bridge in the middle so that people can have a stop in the middle and getting across there, which will make it uh, a lot safer than it had been. And I, I appreciate the fact that the region is willing to do this at this dangerous crossing. Okay, see, uh, seeing no further speakers, I'd like to call the question. Uh, all those in favor? It passes unanimously. Okay, we're getting down to the final pieces here. Um, just uh, correspondence noted, uh, we have uh, from David Jerome uh, regarding the fencing bylaw and from Dr. Derek Coleman, the Cambridge multiplex, uh, multiplex site consideration. Um, any members of council have any unfinished business? Uh, Councilor Devine? Well, I'm not quite sure if it's unfinished or not. It's more of a question than anything. Uh, last uh, general committee meeting of the one previous to, uh, I think we passed a motion and expenditure regarding uh, the cameras in downtown, the downtown core. Uh, can somebody please tell me where we are with that? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Councillor Devine. Uh, I spoke with Mr. Goodrum before he, before he went away, and uh, they're in the process for now doing the procurement process for the cameras. I don't know the exact date when it's going to be done, but they're, uh, that's, that's where the status of the project is. I've got the mic. <laughs> I'm through you, Mr. Chair, and I'm sure I'm going to ask the question that Councillor Devine was going to follow up with. I thought this was a sole source, so I, I don't understand why we're going into a procurement uh, process if it was sole source. 
Uh, through your, uh, Mr. Chairman, through to Councillor Mann and, and Council. Um, as Council would remember, there was a question brought up about the sole source in that project, and as a result, we, we, the direction was to go back and, and follow the, uh, go through the full procurement process, and that's what we're doing. Councillor Gamay? Yeah, uh, yeah, we all understood. Everybody here understood when we voted on it, it was unanimous that it was sole sourced. And we, understand, we understood the reasons why it was sole sourced. And we also understood why there, we had to uh, expedite that because of some of the issues that were going on in the core. Uh, we thought that would help. Uh, was, if we get into situ situations like that in the future, I would like to think that we get a memo saying, okay, or did we get one and I missed it? Well, then obviously I Again, through your, Mr. Chairman, to Councillor Devine, um, as I stated earlier, this matter was before Council. There was, and, and, and I don't want to put on the spot, me and Mr. Fairweather can help me out on this piece. This matter was brought before Council, and there was a, re a, a member of the public that registered to complain about the source sourcing of the a camera, and as a result, that's why we went back to the procurement process. So this matter did come, for, come before Council for that reason, and we are following the process as outlined in our procedures. Um, do any members of council have a notice of motion? Councillor Leggett? Yeah. Notice of motion, it's uh, other business. Um, I've had a few people bring it to my attention that our logo has changed from it's all right here to people, prosperity, and I forget what the third P is, and I'm wondering how that came to be. Um, and whether it's just being used on specific things or whether that's going to be changed on everything because I remember the city going out and hiring somebody to come up with a, a logo and yet this seems to have gone through without that. So if we, somebody could speak to that, please. Uh, city Manager Dyke. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, through your Councillor Leggett. Um, as part of the, um, uh, excuse me, the Cambridge Connected process for the strap plan, that was an issue that or a matter that was, that was discussed at that time. Uh, the, the people place prosperity uh, was the was the, the statement that came out of that process, and we're using that. That's the only thing that changed on the logo. The logo itself remains same. It's the, the remains the same. It's just the wording change, and it's a result of the uh, the responses we got back through Cambridge Connected, and and we proceeded in that manner. Uh, Councillor Leggett. Okay. Through you, Mr. Chair, again. So we're going to do away with the "it's all right here" and just go with those three. That's correct. Right now we've, and the templates have been adjusted to reflect that. I'm just wondering why that didn't come before council for an agreement of council. Um, with respect, if, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. I might have answered one question. Um, again, the, the, the specific request to change did not come through council. It was a part of a, a, a broader piece that was done as part of Cambridge Connected, and that was how it came out of that as part of the promotion of the Cambridge Connected, promotion of our moving forward with the new strategic plan and the new direction and vision statement for the community, and that's where it generated. No, we did not bring a specific motion back to council, but it, but it went through the, the, it was part of the Cambridge Connected piece. Uh, Councillor Leggett. So I can say I'm fine. I'm fine with the changes. I'm happy with the changes. I just didn't understand how that came to be and how I was. How, when people ask me questions, what my response should be. So I appreciate that info. Thank you. Okay. Uh, does any member of council have any updates? Uh, seeing none, I do. I'd just like to remind everyone this Saturday we have. Uh, the Canada 150 celebrations uh, from 9.30 to 11.30 at City Hall. Uh, so please uh, come out and join us in the festivities. And then at 1 o'clock, starting at Bishop and King Street, we have the country's largest Canada Day Parade. So a lot to look forward to this weekend. So, uh, yeah. And uh, that's it. Uh, for the close of the meeting, though, we have Mayor, uh, Mayor Craig. You have that motion? Okay. Sure. One second. And Mr. Chair, before I launch into anything, <laughs> uh, sorry, Mayor, uh, Mayor Craig, before we close the meeting, um, this is Kent's last meeting with us, so we'd like to thank him uh, for his wonderful service, and, and uh, I can't believe it's already the end of June, Kent, so thank you so much for, for all your service, and 
I'd like to let's give Ken a round of applause. Are you from the great work that's done? Thank you, Ken. Mayor Craig. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I uh, announce the uh, the close of the meeting, I thought, if I may say this, I thought you did a great job in the chair tonight. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but you really handled it very well at the last minute being called in. So the uh, committee meeting now is now adjourned at uh, 8.55. Uh, All in favor? <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>